Okay, started the recording. Um, again, welcome to True Tech Training. I'm Bill Spohn, President and CEO of True Tech Tools. Uh, we're going to try to impart a little knowledge here in the next hour or so with regard to airflow testing, tools and operations, also called Airflow 100 or Airflow 101. The invitation or the uh, sign up for the event indicated uh, if you attend it live, you will, uh, and you have submitted your BPI registration number, you will get one BPI CU uh, that was pending that's now been approved. So uh, everybody can uh, can receive that if you've submitted that information with your sign up. The BPI information uh, goes in within the next uh, three days to BPI, and they process it from there. Uh, just for background, in case you're not familiar, True Tech Tools is one of the largest internet distributors of test and measurement products. Uh, we have a lot of background experience in equipment design, operation, uh, test instrument, uh, patents, etc. And we try to bring this knowledge that we have out so that uh, our customers who buy the products from us can, can benefit from us. And we do have this uh, one BPICU alignment for this class. Um, I'm the only one presenting and monitoring today. So if you do type in a question in the question box, uh, please uh, bear with me until I can get around to answer it. Sometimes I answer questions afterwards uh, if they're a little bit too complex for the nature of the of the presentation. And just to put it on the record, watching the recorded session does not qualify you for any BPICUs. That's just a, a limitation of the of the process here. So just to clear it up for everybody, first off, we want to make sure everybody's pronouncing the word correctly. Usually when I do this in a, a public setting, I have everybody stop and say the word anemometer. And I'm going to ask you to do that. Even though I can't hear you, I'm going to ask you to do that now. Anemometer. Just make sure we're pronouncing the word correctly. Uh, that's, that's generally the category or classification for an instrument for measuring wind speed. It's kind of interesting. Mostly we're interested in in gathering up information on CFMs or cubic feet per minute. And to get there, we actually have to go from wind speed to the area over which the wind is blowing at this speed to get the CFM. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So just in case you're not aware, air does have a mass. It's 0 0.075 pounds per cubic foot at standard conditions. Air does take up space, does take up volume. It is variable with volume due to the pressure and temperature of the air and the humidity in it, et cetera. But air does have a mass to it. It's not this invisible, uh, lightweight, uh, just light weightless or massless thing. It's really the conditioning of the air in cubic feet per minute. Uh, but it's rather the pounds of air, the mass of air that's being conditioned. We're adding heat to it. We're removing heat energy from it. Uh, we're adding humidity or removing humidity, water vapor from it. That's really the conditioning, the air conditioning that's going on in systems that we're talking about. And sometimes we're just talking about just the movement of air for ventilation purposes. Um, but it seems to always center around CFMs, but we're really, the thought process behind it is pounds of air in the air conditioning process. So what's a CFM? Just to make sure everybody's on the same page there, it's a cubic foot per minute or cubic feet per minute of airflow. And that comes from, this volume flow rate comes from how much air, how many cubes of air per minute. If you can think of a cubic foot, it would be a box that's one by one by one. So one cubic air, that much air flowing in a minute's time would be one CFM. You could also look at it like the velocity times the area. And most of the time we're talking about measuring the velocity of the air multiplying that average velocity over the area through which it's moving to get the CFM, to get the cubic feet per minute. Uh, I do have a question here or a raised hand. If you could, I'm not going to respond directly to a raised hand. If you could please type a question in the question box. Um, I'm not going to put anybody on open mic here tonight. This is an open mic night. Um, anyway, so we'll, we'll keep on moving here. So Richard, if you could just type your question, uh, I can get to it. So to calculate the CFM, if we talk about uh, this last slide where we say it's based upon the velocity times the area, we need an accurate way of measuring velocity, accurate for the purposes of our use, in order to get the feet per minute, the air velocity, how many feet of air is moving per minute through a certain area. We multiply it by the cross-sectional area, the area through which the air is moving, 
to get that CFM. So if the air velocity measurement is incorrect or has errors prone into it, then it will lead to an incorrect CFM measurement or calculation. Or conversely, if the area measurement is not done correctly, it will lead to an improper CFM. So again, it's based on two things, velocity and area. Both of them have to be for correct, as correct as possible for the purposes of your use. Another interesting fact about air, just to keep in mind, so we understand that it does change, is it's heated or humidified, its volume does increase, and its density decreases. So it seems counterintuitive that the density would decrease for air based upon adding something to it, but it's actually the size of the water molecule versus the, the nitrogen in the air that that actually causes a change in density of the air uh, to decrease it but it also increases its volume. So that's why things like, that's why clouds float. They're higher humidity uh, with a lesser density or a hot air balloon when it's heated, that does cause the, um, uh, the, the movement of the, the decrease in density, which allows the balloon to float. So airflow, usually when we're talking about HVAC systems, that's one big factor when we're, use, we're trying to measure airflow. The other one would be in ventilation. It's usually one of the only two parameters you can really adjust on an air conditioning or refrigeration system. Getting that setting is critical since it's only one of two things you can adjust, uh, the other one being refrigerant charge. And it's usually the first place you should look to make sure there's proper airflow. Again, air is the medium by which we take away the change, the conversion in the air conditioning system, either the conversion of dropping the temperature, increasing the temperature, or increasing or decreasing the humidity. So airflow must be checked before the charge is set, before you put gauges on a system, if you're coming from the HVAC world or aware of that. And if you're trying to measure system capacity, how efficient is this system, changes in airflow will, will affect it directly. And I think it's very easy to imagine uh, if you think about a blocked or dirty filter, impacting the flow rate of the air through the system, through the HVAC system. Of course, it'll be harder to, to transfer the energy to, to, to heat a place, to cool it, to dehumidify or humidify it if you're restricted on airflow. So that would change the way the system operates based upon airflow. So these are some of the reasons why we measure airflow. There are reasons, uh, I, I call it appropriate accuracy. Sometimes you, you cannot make an adjustment beyond a certain level in a system. So you wouldn't necessarily need to have the highest degree of accuracy with your airflow measurement. So that's why there are many different ways to measure it out there, I believe, because there, there are different levels to which you need the accuracy. You do need to make measurements to prove that the system operates correctly. Uh, it helps you know where to start on troubleshooting if it's an airflow issue or not. This is for HVAC work. Uh, can eliminate false causes just to say, you know, there's an assumption about something. We always try to take a measurement before and afterwards. It also gives you a paper trail, you know, documentation of, of where you stand at this point, what the equipment is it's set up. It helps some contractors get factory support, helps you feel better at night about uh, being able to, uh, that, that you've taken care of your customer or client. Now here's a big, com somewhat complex uh, overview of a, well, let's call it a, a traditional residential light commercial heating and air conditioning system. Uh, it's really got, I wrote this, uh, drew this up for, um, maybe I need artistic help here, but I, I drew this up for an article that I wrote uh, to cover all the different type of measurements that are required around an HVAC system, which help you diagnose, either install it, size it properly, which means design it, install it properly, make sure it's set up properly, or service or maintain it properly. So there's, there's a lot of things going on here, and we're just going to narrow in to the few things where we talk about airflow in the system. We won't be talking about refrigerant charge or electrical measurements or, or combustion in this session. We'll just be talking about airflow. But you can see in an air distribution system, air is the main heat transfer medium. It does cover a lot of equipment performance. So that's why we talk about it today. Um, on the previous slide, we did talk about uh, air testing blower door. Um, is one of the air parameters we could be testing or talking about, but we won't be talking about that today. That's a separate uh, topic or subtopic unto itself. So let's minimize that previous picture and just take a look at airflow through the system. Um, 
we have the returned air CFM. Okay, so that's the cubic feet per minute. That's the airflow, the airflow rate, the mass flow that's moving through the system. Uh, sometimes it's also of interest to measure temperature and humidity. We also have the delivered CFM temperature and humidity. So these factors come together to talk about is the system effective at, at performing the way we'd like it to. Uh, then we also have the system airflow, how much airflow is moving through the system. Uh, the delivered airflow could be in multiple locations and the returned airflow could be in multiple locations. But the system airflow moves all through the system. That's what's moving through the heating or cooling elements of the system. And then additionally, again, to system performance in an air conditioning mode, there's also airflow around the condenser. The temperature and the air velocity around the condenser also control the way that system performs because that's where the heat is actually rejected from the system. So let's take a look at system airflow. So we're going to be looking at these main areas here, delivered system and return airflow, because there are different measurement principles and different measurement devices involved with this. So let's take a look at system airflow next. One of the basic um, kind of traditional ways of measuring system airflow, system AF, is a static pressure drop. And the way that's done is the manufacturer has calibrated in their laboratory. They know how their components resist airflow, and the resistance of airflow causes a change in pressure. So we have a static pressure over on this side and a static pressure on this side. Static pressure one, static pressure two. That difference in static pressure has been characterized by the manufacturer over their known resistance. Usually it's the heat exchanger or perhaps the air conditioning coil. And they've come up with a table of values. And I'll show you a table in a minute, these table of values. So this static pressure tip, is, we'll call it the static pressure half of a pitot tube. And we'll get into what a pitot tube is in a minute so you get the full idea of what that, that accounts for. You, you do need to have uh, a device, and it could be an analog gauge or a digital gauge. We recommend digital to measure the difference in pressure over this known resistance. Some of the benefits of this, and probably some of the reasons why it be has become uh, popular, is because it's fairly low cost. It's pretty easy to use. You do need some kind of manometer. We again, we recommend a digital manometer. Um, the total kit price is around two hundred twenty bucks, but uh, I've, I've in, implemented this uh, term pay for performance and you really pay in the measuring tools for the performance that you get out of them. In, in this case, it's a lower price. You pay less, but the performance matters. It matters if you have this known resistance information. If you're missing this information, a static pressure measurement can be interesting to tell you some things, but it really won't tell you about airflow. So you do need to have the equipment manufacturer tables. Uh, it does state a, a known resistance, and many times it may state a dry coil, a wet coil. But if you get into dirty coils and how wet is a wet coil, this can affect the resistance of the airflow, which affects the pressure reading, which sort of affects the calibration of your whole system in the way that you're trying to measurement, measure it. You also have to consider any kind of velocity drag or differences in pressure at the walls of the ducts and your technique matters. You'd want to be careful if this resistance happens to be the air conditioning coil, which is a sealed copper tube that's full of refrigerant uh, in gas or liquid state, and you drill into it and you cause a leak, you've caused them, you've, you've uh, destroyed the system integrity and things have to be repaired. So it does require some technique issues. It does require the manufacturer's equipment tables, and you have to know really what kind of coil you have in place based upon what the manufacturer calls for. And this is really uh, an induct measurement. You cannot use this technique at a supply or at a return, you know, at a supply grill or return grill. Uh, and it's, it's used for usually for system airflow measurement because you're measuring it across the resistance of known, known resistance of uh, system components. So it isn't something you can do in a duct run. It isn't something you can do. It is not something you can do at a supply or return. So the tools involved would be a manometer, it could be an analog manometer um, or, you know, uh, or an incline manometer or something called the magnahelic, which is a brand name by Dwyer. Uh, these are mechanical devices that either move the fluid by pressing on it or move an internal coiled tube uh, with the pressure change in the tube. Or digital manometers, which can be uh, standalone manometers or could be built in your combustion analyzer or other meters that you may have. 
or it could be part of the, uh, the digital gauge that comes with your blower door or your duct tester kit. So you may already have a digital manometer if you want to get into doing this kind of testing. Check around and see if you have the right range, and usually they're, they're in the correct range to be able to do this static pressure test. You also need static pressure tips and some hose. Um, and sticking a hose inside a hole that you drill in the ductwork, uh, it requires quite a bit of a refinement. I know some people out there advising it, um, but I would advise getting the static pressure tip. It's just a lot more reliable way of getting to the right point to make that measurement. And of course, you need a connecting hose to connect your manometer to your static pressure tip. And just to cover some of the digital manometers available, there are standalone ones that, um, that operate uh, just for pressure measurement only. Some have built-in calculations to do CFM uh, if you're using them with a pitot tube. Some of them are built into combustion analyzers, uh, but make sure it's a differential pressure meter because you have to measure that pressure difference over the known resistance. It can't just be a single a single tap, you have to be able to measure the pressure difference. It could also be part of your blower door or duct tester kit, as we talked about. So um, the Energy Conservatory, uh, Minneapolis blower door or duct blaster, or Retrotex blower door or duct tightness tester. So you may already have these tools, and these are kind of price ranges. But the lowest you can get away with is about 150 to 170 bucks to get a good solid digital manometer. And again, we recommend digital. You can get the analog ones. But be uh, careful on how you use them. You want to make sure that they're upright and aligned correctly. So let's actually take a look at this component that's called the static pressure tip. And I just got a question here. Can you confirm that the positive tap of static pressure should be located between the furnace and evaporator coil? The, the location of the, of the pressure tip, the static pressure tip, is where the manufacturer wants you to locate it. You got to take a look at they see and see what kind of what part of the system you're supposed to measure the difference over, and you have to have their table of values. And we'll show that table of values shortly, so you know what that is. But it uh, the answer is sorry. It depends. Like a lot of things in this world, it depends on the information you're given as to where you locate that. There's not a universal location, but it's a location that the manufacturer will give you. Let's jump back in here at static pressure tip. The static pressure tip. Um, measures, that's as it's named, a static pressure. That would be the balloon pressure that's around this device. This The end of the tip is blocked off. It's blunted. Um, there are only pressure ports that will accept the balloon pressure that's not got anything to do with the velocity pressure. This is faced into the wind, into the velocity. None of the velocity affects this. Only the static pressure around here, the inflation pressure, affects it. So the airflow is hitting it this way. It's supposed to be intended to be perpendicular to airflow and just sense the balloon pressure of the duct. It's pretty easy to use. It's cost effective. Uh, they're less than 20 bucks each. You, usually you need two in order to do a static pressure difference test. Um, and if you want to get into the nitty gritty, uh, air density correction may be necessary because that earlier we talked about air having a mass of or a weight of 0 0.075 pounds per cubic foot. That's true just at standard air conditions. That will vary depending upon altitude, humidity, and temperature of the air. Uh, that, those factors um, will change the air density, which could actually change the reading that you get. Um, so if, if you're looking for a really refined reading, you may have to correct for it or use an alternate method. Just having the static pressure difference does not equate to airflow. You do have to have that manufacturer's information. Um, and again, it's for in-duct measurement only. So this slide looks like a repeat of the last one. <laughs> um, I'll get rid of that. So measuring the external static pressure is the resistance against which the fan must pump the airflow through the system. So this airflow is measured by the manufacturer. They measure the pressure drop at different points. And from those points, you can determine what the CFM is from those, those pressure drops. It really cannot be used uh, as a measurement tool unless you have the measurement, the manufacturer's information. And just to give you an idea of the range, so you know if you have the right kind of digital manometer to do the testing, it's usually less than one inch of water column. That's uh, actually the pressure at which water would elevate 
one inch inside a tube, uh, that that's pretty much the range of what you'll be operating in, less than one inch water column. And ECM motors, electronically commutated motors, uh, do make uh, make this uh, pretty much an impossible tool to use because their variation over static pressure, they actually auto compensate for it. So that's it's not it's really it's used for um, PSC type motors is where you use this technique. So let's actually take a look at an actual manufacturer's data chart that I've been speaking about for the last couple minutes. So this manufacturer. Um, talks about a specific model and cabinet size. So you have to match up and make sure this is what you're looking at. Uh, it talks about the, you get different readings, different static pressure drops, different external static pressures based upon configuration. The configuration, if there's electric heaters present, those again would be coils that would be adding resistance to the airflow and would change things. So if they are or are not present, that could change things. The blower motor speed, it, it's characterized at different blower motor speeds and also the voltage at which you're running the blower motor. So you can see that there's variations. What you have here at the cross the top is the external static pressure drop, which you would get from your manometer when properly positioning the probes. Um, you would get, if you say you got a half inch water column of external static pressure drop, and you were looking at a cabinet dash 21 with electric heaters, with no electric heaters, running on high speed at 230 volts. If you had a half inch of water column, your airflow, your CFM would be around 1205 CFM. And you can take a look and see that that's the CFM up here. CFM is the top number, center number is the watts, lower number is the RPM. The interesting thing to look at in this chart, and I kind of threw this in as just a little ringer here, this is actually an ECM motor. And the reason why you can tell it's an ECM motor is, as you go across and your static pressure increases, your CFM does not change too awful much. It changes 6 CFM out of 1,200. That's a very small fraction, a very small percentage change. It's because an ECM motor continues to use additional energy to work against the pressure drop to continue to do its job to move its CFM. So it's it's not um, it's really hard to use um, the static pressure drop because you don't have a lot of resolution out here. Um, your motor is going to continue to work. The other interesting thing about this chart is to look at basically you're looking at almost 1200 to 1200 here across the range of static pressure. But look at the power consumption in watts. That's the second item. 193 watts going up to almost 400 watts. So that's a doubling of the power to work against more pressure. So this gives you an idea of where the ECM, where its role it plays, is it, it always tries to keep pushing out the same cubic feet per minute of air, but if you have additional duct resistance or system pressure resistance, it will uh, do so at the, at the expense of power. Here's an idea of what, again, what a system, uh, more complex system would look like. Uh, you, you do have to have this calibrated resistance, and it's measured at the system or at the unit. It's not something that's measured at the supply or return registers. Um, and this static pressure, again, these pressure arrows that are pointing kind of perpendicular to the flow, that's what's inflating the ductwork. Sometimes in some buildings you can hear ductwork going boom, 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 as an AC system is turned on in a large building. That's the ductwork actually inflating. It can also be measured across the evaporator coil. And it's usually the, the pressure drop is seen across coils, filters, secondary heat exchangers. When you're trying to make uh, an induct measurement, and this would be for um, measurements with, uh, say, a, a, a pitot tube or a mini vane anemometer or a hot wire anemometer. Um, these are other measuring devices. You would want to make those measurements in an area where you have, you're about two to three duct diameters away from any turns, transitions, or fittings. 
Uh, so this is uh, away from the turn, from this uh, return drop in this area here, and the uh, where the, the return air is flowing through. Again, this is a return coming in, uh, moving up to the system and, and flowing out through the, uh, through the supply end. So in a hard ducted system, this would be an ideal place to take that measurement. One of the tools you can use for making an induct measurement, again, we're still in the category of induct measurements, is a mini vane. Um, we consider this uh, pretty much a non-invasive measurement. Non-invasive in the sense that it's a very aerodynamically shaped head that allows the airflow to, to bypass and flow through it. And it, it does not block much of the airflow, so it doesn't interfere with the airflow measurement. It's got very good repeatability. It has a jewel bearing in there that allows the little propeller to spin, and that's tracked with a, uh, an inductive pickup that then gives you the, the readout in the feet per minute and then the calculation uh, for CFM on the screen of the unit. We've, we've tested these out and found that you can rotate and move them around about 10% change in the, the angle that you have them inside the ductwork. Uh, they should be uh, perpendicular and inter intercept the total airflow, but even a little bit of air like 10% change will result in an error of less than 1%. So they're very tolerant of uh, operator positioning. Another type of measurement is the hot wire anemometer. What, the way it works is similar to, to, uh, to uh, uh, if you're from just, you know, on a breezy day, drop some water across the back of your palm. And as the air blows and, and evaporates that water off your palm, you'll feel a drop in temperature in your skin. That's the wind chill effect. So this bead at the tip of the probe inside the probe of this device is a wire that's heated up to a specific temperature and has a temperature measuring uh, device in the base of it. That hot wire is heated to a certain temperature and as the air flows over it, as the airflow changes, the circuitry inside works to maintain that temperature at the temperature sensing device. So in order to maintain the temperature requires more current. So basically the cur additional current required is proportional to the air airflow or air velocity. What's great about um, pitot tubes, or excuse me, hot wire anemometers, is that they have a really broad range. They're very easy to use. You just need to put them into the airflow. Make sure you're perpendicular to uh, the airflow and intercepting the airflow you wish wish to measure. Uh, they have a broad range of measurement. It means that, that means they'll pick up fairly fairly low velocities, velocities up to fairly high velocities, but they do have some limitations. Again, if you're trying to get a very accurate measurement denser air does have higher mass. So that's, you may have to do a density correction. Again, density correction for temperature change, humidity, content change, or altitude or barometric pressure change. However, most of the newer hot wire anemometers include the temperature correction, which is the larger factor. So the, the one that we've shown here, the field piece STA2, actually does have a temperature correction built into it. So it is giving that kind of first order correction for air density. And all this stuff happens behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about it. You just need to know what's inside your product and also the level of measurement that uh, accuracy you need. Um, because you're, it's the wind chill effect, if you put a, a glove on your hand, you wouldn't feel the wind chill effect. So imagine if you contaminated the tip or the hot wire, the hot bead, that would be like putting a glove or a jacket on it. That would definitely change its, its reaction to the, uh, to the air velocity. So they, the limitations are they're subject to contamination. So you would not use these, say, in a, in a restaurant, um, you know, a flow hood and a kitchen flow hood where you could contaminate with grease or dirt. Uh, and you would not stick it into an area, into a cavity where you weren't sure what was there, get it contaminated, and then expect a good measurement for it, from it. The, the other limitation is it, it doesn't intercept a fairly small area. Um, the area is about the size of a period uh, that you would make with a pen, a pen point. So that's the area over which you're measuring. Uh, it's a fraction of a square inch. So if your airflow is turbulent or chaotic, like it is, unfortunately, most of the time in most places, uh, you're going to have to take a lot of measurements and do some averaging in order to get the average airflow that's moving through. Um, that's one of the challenges of measuring airflow is turbulence. Um, spinning, rotating, changing velocity, uh, air still moving, it's still doing its job, but 
but it's hard to capture and quantify it with a device that's measuring just a very small cross-section of that area. And again, these are used for induct measurements. This wouldn't be something that, that I would consider really suitable for grill or supply or return measurements. Again, because at grills, it supplies, especially at supplies, you have a lot of turbulence. You have jets of air that are coming out through the, through the louvers in the grill. Uh, on returns, uh, it's, it's possible to use a, a hot wire uh, because you usually have like a lazier airflow moving across the face of a grill, but you have to be at the proper distance away in order to intercept that air as it's sweeping in to the return. But induct, induct it works pretty well, again, if you pay attention to the limitations of where to locate uh, two to three duct diameters away from transitions in the ductwork. So let's move on to the pitot tube. The pitot tube uh, is a very uh, traditional type measuring device. It relies upon pressure measurement. It relies upon the impact pressure of air that's sensed on a pressure sensor. And you have here, it looks sort of like a static pressure tip, except now we have the total pressure coming in that's due to both the inflation pressure, the balloon pressure in the duct, as well as the velocity, the speed at which the air is moving. So that velocity pressure moves in and through to one port of your differential manometer. The static pressure now moves through to the, through this outside tube. This is a tube in a tube through the outside tube to be connected to your manometer and give you the, um, the static pressure. The, the fact of the matter is if you take the total pressure and subtract the static pressure, you are left with the velocity pressure or pressure strictly due to the air velocity. So the, you will get from your manometer a pressure reading that properly connected to a pitot tube in an airstream, you'll get a, a, um, a reading that is equivalent to velocity pressure. Some uh, digital manometers actually do the conversion from velocity pressure into, uh, into velocity or feet per minute. Again, we talked about feet per minute tends to be the, the major factor we're measuring that we multiply by the area to get the CFM. The uh, some manometers include that. Um, don't make the mistake of like I did years ago of measuring multiple points with your pitot tube and then uh, just looking at the average pressure and then calculating your velocity. You actually have to go from your pressure change directly to your velocity, then average that. The reason being, there's actually a square root function in there. Um, in order to, uh, to to move from velocity pressure into velocity, if you don't, if you can't add square roots. You have to uh, calculate them individually, then add and get an average. So it's pretty cost effective, fairly easy to use. Uh, again, there's this density limitation, but some um, digital manometers actually do include a way to adjust the air density. So if you do know that factor, you can adjust and improve that. Um, some of them include inputs for that. Some of them actually have sensors built in to check the barometric, the temperature, humidity of the air, and do all that correction again in the background for you. Uh, again, this is pay for performance. The more expensive meters do that for you, and you may need that level of accuracy. You may not, which or or you may want to, you may choose to do it yourself and spend some extra time and maybe some extra equipment to do that. So it's a choice you have to make. Trying to measure a very low velocity with uh, a pitot tube can be difficult unless you have a precision manometer that has the calculation built in. Uh, and that would be something like your blower door or your duct blaster or duct leakage tester manometer. Those actually have uh, very fine resolution, um, precise manometers as we call them. Um, some of the, the less expensive manometers will not allow you to measure low velocity because they cannot detect those uh, low pressures. And again, pitot tube, induct, very difficult to use at supplies and returns. I'd say nearly impossible to use at supplies um, without some kind of additional apparatus and uh, not so easy to use at returns. So let's take a look at the pitot tube array. And basically um, this is sold as uh, something called a true flow grid, which is a product of the Energy Conservatory or the Minneapolis blower door folks. Um, it basically has built into it multiple pitot tubes in an array that yield an average velocity immediately. It, it yields an average number. An awful lot of uh, research work went into this. I believe it uh, was partially funded at least by a Department of Energy grant. 
so there's a lot of good science that goes into the, the background of this. It has the same kind of limitations as a pitot tube. However, if you have those uh, density correction factors and you need that kind of resolution, you can do that on the digital end. Um, it's not exactly the same as runtime conditions, but it's pretty darn close. In fact, there's a, a factor which you take at pre-measurement before you insert the array into the true flow grid into the system. You actually take a measurement of the NSOP. That stands for normal system operating pressure. And you use that, there's actually a calculation they've developed that will correct for the introduction of this grid into the system. It is uh, invasive to the system, but again, that NSOP factor does correct for you. Um, and if you, if you place it, you do have to be knowledgeable of where you place it in the system and make sure you get full air, full airflow over it. Uh, if your duct design does not allow for full airflow over the grid and it's only partial airflow, it could lead to some errors with it. But the uh, instruction manual with the device has a very thoroughly detailed and illustrated to explain uh, where this can be used and what situations and, and um, to get good results from it. Um, this again is a product that is used for system airflow and the cost is between um, around $875 for the device um, excuse me, about a, around $875 for the digital manometer. And you do need a special digital manometer, either the Retrotech or the Energy Conservatory. And you have to set it in a particular mode to intercept the, um, the, uh, the pressure readings and do the conversion. Alternately, you can use the tables that are in the True Flow Grid instruction manual and use any manometer of appropriate range and accuracy. And you can do it um, yourself. You can use a lookup table or you can use one of these digital manometers and the calculations actually presented to you. So your, your basic basic cost is around 775 bucks plus some effort on your own and your own digital manometer to get there. Or you can add a, a higher tech digital manometer that does the calculation for you. So we're moving away from supplies and induct measurement to supply and return airflow measurement. The uh, going back to the mini vane, uh, which we've covered already, uh, there, there is uh, just to give you a couple examples, some photographs here of what they looked like zoomed in. Uh, you can see there's a little propeller located inside the head. The vane anemometer is one you would use. Um, th this is showing both the mini vane and kind of the maxi vane or the large vane or the, the, uh, the, the little big vane. Um, they have a pro propeller in them, both of them, to, to illustrate the technology type. The propeller rotates proportional to the speed of airflow. Because of that, it's measuring airflow directly, and there's no need for density correction. So this averages over an area, uh, instead of like the pitot tube, which averages over a pinpoint area, this actually takes into account a larger area over this four inch circle, or in the case of a half inch circle for the mini vane for the induct. And there are limitations on how this uh, can be used. Uh, the limitations are, are turbulence. When there's highly turbulent situations where the airflow is varying quite wildly or arranging quite wildly, that's when you implement the averaging function in the meter to make sure that it's, it's getting a good average reading across the, the, um, the, the period of measurement. Or uh, you can also have situations where there's actually what we call fan swirl. If the, if the air velocity is coming off of a... Uh, a propeller fan, which is sort of unusual in an HVAC system, mostly the squirrel cage fans, but coming off a propeller fan, you could actually have spiraling air moving down the duct, which would induce uh, higher velocity readings or lower velocity readings, depending upon the direction of spiral, to the uh, to the vane anemometer. So there are there are some kind of tricks and uh, things to be aware of as you move if you as you try to get in closer to um, higher accuracy air uh, measurements. Um, Supplies and returns are the, the main application for the, for the large vein anemometer. And that's especially true on flex duct systems because the flex duct systems, um, due to the nature of the duct of the flex duct with the, um, the, 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 the coil type of uh, variations uh, in this, the surface, you really don't have a lot of smooth airflow. You have an awful lot of turbulent airflow. So it's hard to use an induct measurement. And usually when you get airflow measurements with a hard, with a flex duct system, you're usually in there taking them at the, uh, the central, central return or adding up all the returns. So 
air velocity can be used to um, to, to, to do a balancing. Um, you can measure the air velocity, just the velocity alone. You needn't necessarily, uh, if you have the same type of grill in every uh, supply, you needn't measure and calculate the CFM exactly. You could just measure the air velocity and make sure they're all uniform or uniform proportional to the load in the room. Uh, one thing to be careful of, the face velocity or the air moving through most ducts, if you should try to keep it between under 600 CFM. If you get much over 700 CFM, it can usually be a whistling noise that accompanies it, which is usually annoying to the occupants. And if you do this velocity balancing uh, with equal size rooms, equal registers, you can get in a ballpark of, um, of delivering prop, making sure you're delivering proper conditioned air to the space. And if you choose to use a, a mini vane, you can do a K factor correction to, in order to be able to determine if the, the CFM is correct from the supply of a large vein and basically to sum up and measure all the supplies and then measure the system supply with the mini vein, then you can determine what your K factor is if you don't have that. And we'll be talking about that. Um, I'm gonna jump to that here. Um, to, to be able to measure the K factor, that's the open area, the cross-sectional area which is something that comes from the manufacturer of the grill type. So that's an important thing to be aware of, that you need that on supply type measurement. OK, now we'll move on to um, supply and return measurement. And the category is capture devices. Um, th this is, uh, it seems kind of surprising to some, but logical to others, is that a plastic bag and a stopwatch could be used for a capture device. Um, the the way it's uh, done, it's it's pretty cheap. Um, the accuracy depends a lot upon your technique. Uh, so this again is paying for performance. If you're really good at this, you can get some fairly good readings. Basically, you need to know the total volume of the bag, and you need to be able to tell when you've applied the bag across the grill up until the point where the bag is inflated, such that it's causing back pressure in the system. You could add a static pressure tip to the bag, tape it into the bag, and look for um, this I learned from Bruce Manclark out in Oregon. Um, he works for Fluid Market Strategies, Clear Result Company. Um, basically, you can look for a spike in the pressure reading with your static pressure tip that's been taped into the bag. Uh, that would tell you that your bag is, is now fully inflated and you could stop your stopwatch. So if you know how many cubic feet are inside the bag and you know when it's become full in your definition of full, and you have a time over which it's become full, you'll know cubic feet in a minute. And you'll be able to capture the air and bag it up. Um, as you can imagine, there'd be problems with starting and stopping the watch, knowing when the bag is full. So there's a lot of issues with this. Again, um, this is more human intervention and performance uh, affect this one than a lot of other systems. There are also flow hoods that either use uh, pedo arrays or hot wires, and we talked about both those technologies just a few moments ago, but there would basically be an array of um, tubes in the system. We talked about the true flow grid having the, uh, the pedo tube array in it. There might be a similar one in, in a flow hood uh, that would, it would actually funnel and capture the air from a supply or capture the air moving into a return and move it through a measurement grid and then it has a device, a digital device, or sometimes an analog device that actually gives you the total CFM. The, the thing that the, the capture hood, um, they do cost more, but you get more performance out of them. Um, they do capture all the flow. Uh, unlike the bag, you don't have to tell when it's full. Uh, you just, it's a continuous flow through the device. They provide minimal back pressure because they're, it's a, it's a sloping kind of, uh, flow into the unit. They, they don't uh, back pressure the system. And they also give you the display directly because they know the cross-sectional area through which they're moving across your array. Um, they can also have um, like an egg crate inside, which would laminarize or turn the flow into uniform. So that turbulent flow could then be kind of knocked down into, into line and turned into a laminar flow array. So there's a lot of different elements to, to flow hoods, which, which make them um, sort of a, a nicer 
quicker, uh, easier way to get to your CFM measurement. They're pretty fast to set up and easy to use. Again, a lot of times it's just uh, turn them, uh, set them up, turn them on, push the button, and you can see the little red button down here. Some of them even are wired up so that you can just tap a button as you're holding it against the grill and get the reading. Um, some of the limitations are the accuracy could be mass dependent, but again, you got to check with your manufacturer specs and see if they allow for or have accounted for the variability, again, of temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, or altitude. That would have on the density of the air because it is dependent on the mass or the density of the air. The other limitation I'd say is the size of the device. Sometimes you're uh, in existing construction and there's just not enough room to set up and use the device, in which case you might want to look at what's called a low flow bilometer, which can be used with its kind of with its hood off. Uh, it's calibrated to be used that way. Uh, that could be used directly in um, lower flow situations. So you have to again tune in the the type of device to the type of measurement you're making and understand what, uh, what, what you're after for it. So in the array of flow, flow hoods, there's the, basically they have a more, more generally a pitot tube array that's inside the system, runs through a common sensor, does all its averaging. It gives you a snapshot operation. Uh, a lot of the designs are multifunctional in that you can disconnect the the measuring device, and it is a uh, basically a, a pressure measuring device, or hot wire anemometer can be connected, or a, a, a humidity probe, or other types of temperature probes can be connected. So you have basically this meter that can be used for several things, as well as the capture hood uh, effect. Uh, a lot of them are back pressure compensated, so they they know at which point the uh, airflow is going to be affected by the fact that you've smothered the duct, that you've uh, impacted the system airflow, and will actually give you a signal to introduce uh, various means of, of compensating for backflow. Um, I have uh, one person saying there's no audio. I'm hoping that's not a general problem. Uh, sometimes it happens uh, due to internet connection on your end. Um, okay, audio is fine. Thank you for that feedback. Thank you. Uh, we, we have another question here. I've heard complaints and concerns about accuracy. How big an issue is it real, really anyway? Um, there was uh, one of the government labs, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, did a study, and there's a report. You could pretty much easily find it by Googling it. Uh, just do flow hood study, LBL, or Lawrence Berkeley Labs, um, that which uh, in certain situations showed that a flow hood could have uh, a measurement uh, error or given an inaccurate result, but the manufacturers uh, I know of at least uh, TSI and I'm not sure about the others, but TSI has responded to that. And there are um, basically there's there's techniques on how you use a device, like so many other things, uh, as well as um, accessories that will improve the measurement, improve the quality of measurement. Um, some of it had to do with the I believe it was the location. If you locate the grill you're trying to measure in the corner of the device you do induce back pressure, so centering is important. The other thing is the, the egg crate or the, the ability to uh, laminarize the flow with an accessory that can be popped into the unit. Um, that helps out an awful lot with the, um, with the accuracy. Um, and how big an issue is it really? Again, sorry, it depends. It depends on the kind of measurement you're trying to take. Um, you're welcome, Greg. Um, it depends upon the kind of measurement you wish to take and what you're going to do with that information. Um, if you can only make an adjustment in system airflow uh, in 250 CFM increments, uh, do you need to measure down to 5 CFM to make that judgment call as to which way it goes? Perhaps not. So keep, keep in mind where you're using the information. Uh, you know, I sell instruments. That, that's my business. That's my livelihood. Uh, I'd like you to buy expensive stuff. But if you don't need expensive stuff, don't buy expensive stuff. Consider what the appropriate level of accuracy you need for the measurement you're making. And there are, like a lot of things, different models available. Basically, your low flow is in the 500 range, um, and then uh, 2,500 CFM for your higher flow models. And the price points vary between 1,500 for the low flow up to around 3,200, maybe a little bit less. Uh, the Canamax brand is a little bit less. It's uh, under $3,000 for the 2,500 model, 2,500 CFM model. Um, Here's a device um, that's got uh, has a, the ability to uh, to derive a 
uh, or make a measurement that is really precise. Um, the Energy Conservatory uh, worked actually with the labs, I believe, the national labs, again, to develop this device. Uh, it's based off of your duct blaster. So it uses your duct blaster fan to compensate for the back pressure that would be introduced by attaching the skirt or blocking off the airflow um, from, your, from the supplier return. Uh, it uses the same digital manometer um, and a, a fan controller to control the speed automatically and a measurement array in here. So this is basically the, the device here is from this line up is called the Flow Blaster. Uh, it's an accessory for about 1200 bucks and it attaches to your to the fan and manometer part of your duct blaster which you may already have or is around a 1900 2000 dollars device to buy so you're basically in the ballpark around 3000 to 3200 for for this kind of device um, what it affords is the fact that this compensating fan runs at a variable speed to offset the smothering effect that you place on the ductwork so to the to the system, because the uh, airflow does have this uh, ability to change density uh, with pressure, if you cover a duct to try to make a measurement, you're going to affect the system airflow, and you're no longer making a measurement. You've affected the measurement. So it's I, I used in one presentation the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, trying to make a measurement affects the measurement. And in this case, the compensating fan makes the flow blaster skirt invisible to the ductwork, invisible to the system. It, you measure, you monitor the external pressure in the room, and you make the external pressure, or the internal pressure under the hood, equal to the pressure in the room. So it nulls it out. So the system does not feel any ill effect from back pressure due to this hood, because this fan is helping the airflow through. And of course, there's a measuring array, uh, a pitot tube array, which allows the, the digital manometer to pick up and measure the airflow. That's a really clever device. Um, it's an auto compensating. Uh, you do need to power this fan. Uh, so there's an external battery pack which comes with it. You clip it on your belt uh, in order to power the motor uh, in your duct blaster fan. Um, and uh, it's, it's a pretty neat device which you can add on. You, you do have to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you have to flip the, uh, the fan around if you're doing supplies and return measurement in order to, get, to maintain optimum accuracy. So there is a little bit of um, mechanics involved uh, in assembling it and, and setting it up for different situations, but very clever device overall. Also uh, recently coming over from Norway um, and being uh, distributed here by um, Master Distributed by Retrotech and also available for sale for TrueTech. By the way, everything I've talked about so far is available for, for sale through TrueTech. Um, you have the a device called the um, the Flow Finder Mark II, and it comp it has an internal pressure sensor which compensates for the back pressure, similar to the Flow Blaster. Uh, in this case, it's a it's an integrated unit. It's a dedicated purpose unit. It's used just for one thing for this test, unlike uh, the Duck Blaster, which um, it's part of the Duck Blaster is used here. So again, you, it's great to have choices. Um, the Flow Finder uh, comes with a, a battery pack. Uh, a color LCD display, an internal pressure sensor, and basically I, I've used it, actually used it on my house. Um, you basically walk up, you, you turn it on, walk up to, uh, to a grill, <clears throat> either supply or return grill, press this uh, red button, and it does this little thing where it ramps up, it runs an internal fan, uh, and it, uh, it compensates for pressure, for back pressure, and gives you the CM, CFM results on display. You can also store away the information on an SD card uh, by different rooms. You can read up to or measure up to 500 CFM. Actually, measures up to around 320, 330 CFM. It does an extrapolation. Uh, you might be familiar with extrapolations from your can't reach 50 factors, uh, which is what the Energy Conservatory and Retrotech use that when you can't reach 50 pascals depressurization of a building. It does the same kind of thing, like a can't reach whatever factor to give you an extrapolation up to 500 CFM. But beyond that, it really cannot make a measurement. So it's it's really associated with really lower flowing uh, type supplies and returns, um, not with your high flow uh, type applications. 
Although because it does do this, um, it has to have a compensating fan in it. You can do multiple measurements across a grill. So if you had a 24 inch grill, like the, the testing that I did, this is this device, this area here is about an eight by eight inches. Um, I did a 24 inch grill by taking three snapshots and adding them together and then comparing them to a flow hood measurement and got very, very close answers to that. So I, I did that testing actually a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so a pretty impressive device. Uh, really, this device and the um, Flow Blaster together uh, give you that kind of ultimate accuracy uh, with the compensating fan and single piece device and pretty lightweight, about five pounds. Uh, did not mention price on this one, uh, $3,900, almost $4,000 for this. But again, this is where you pay for performance. If it's the right kind of tool, you need this kind of accuracy, go for it. Did want to make mention about um, supply and return measurements with scoops, mini hoods, and flow funnels. They really cannot be used for volumes above about 75 CFM due to back pressure. And with all the discussion just a few moments ago about powered flow hoods and the need to uh, compensate for back pressure, I think you can understand why that's true. Uh, you put this device over your basic, uh, when it's above 75 CFM, you're going to be pushing back on the system or restricting the airflow into the system, not allowing proper airflow, and it's not going to give you a reading. So uh, be wary of using a scoop, a mini hood, or a funnel um, just because it's you know, a couple hundred dollar add-on to your vein manometer. Um, but if it's above 75 CFM that you're measuring, you're really not going to get a, a very good quality measurement at all. And the error, and I've had this by, confirmed by other people, the error crops up. Uh, moves to moves pretty quickly through the 30 to 50 percent range error um, with just a small change in velocity above that. So it's not even like you can get away with this 100 CFM. That's not even possible. Um, duct leakage, going back to uh, duct pressures and talking about airflow through duct pressures and duct leakage. Again, we consider this part of the overall airflow measurement. Um, duct leakage test. I'm I'm guessing that a lot of people here are familiar with that. But basically, you seal off the vents. You look for an internal duct pressure with your hose. Um, attach your duct uh, pressurization device, um, the Energy Conservatory duct blaster or the RetroTech uh, duct leakage tester um, to the return air vent and create and induce the pressure inside the duct, which you that would then measure on your digital manometer, either type of digital manometer, and look at, um, look at the flow rate that's moving through the duct leakage fan. Um, to, to see what kind of leakage pressure. Uh, the, basically, they, the um, blower doors and duct leakage testers have a pressure sensing ring in them, which is similar to a pitot tube, uh, but it senses the pressure drop that's across the fan. And the fans are calibrated so they know exactly how they're built. They know exactly how much airflow relates to a pressure drop across the fan. So this is kind of like your circular pitot tube is built in to your um, blower door or duct blaster fan or duct leakage tester fan. And then always make sure you have the correct mode set up on your digital manometer uh, so that you get, get the correct readout during a duct leakage test or blower door test. Um, there, there is a way to do um, the subtraction method. Uh, we're, we're not going to get into this at this point. Um, but to, you can actually do a subtraction method and look for pressure changes uh, to determine what your, your duct flow rate is. Um, and there's, uh, that, that's also possible. It's in, illustrated in the instruction manual. Um, got a question here. Do I have a preference for pressurizing or depressurizing when measuring duct leakage? Uh, actually, I took part in a training course by one of the manufacturers, and uh, we, we did some testing. And... You do get a small difference whether you pressurize or depressurize. Um, whole, there's a whole theory, the physics to whole flow, the, the flow of air over a hole or over an edge. Um, if you're, generally speaking, um, I would say it's positive pressure for duct leakage, uh, although doing positive and negative or positive or negative uh, can, can lead you to, to like a more re robust result. Um, and then uh, just got another question. The mysterious Ring 4 for Minneapolis uh, Duck Blaster. Yes, I believe uh, Ring 4 is now available. 
Um, I think they're called the D ring, in fact, but um, no, ring four, sorry. So that, that is available. Um, I, I think it should be on our website. Um, I'll, I'll check on that, or you can check on that. Um, if you want to just go to truetechtools.com and check uh, underneath the duck blaster, we should have it listed as an accessory. Okay, uh, we're just at an hour here, and I'm going to wrap up and then take any questions you might have. Did want to make sure everyone's a, a aware of our resources page, which is a new page. You'll find it in the upper left corner. Uh, there's a drop-down menu which would tell you the type of resources, but you go to truetechtools.com slash resources. We have some featured downloads, uh, featured videos. You can get links to more of our videos. We have over 60 videos available. And then you could scroll through and see we have you know, signing up for webinars, books and guides, uh, downloads, training, videos, and software, kind of put all that information type products together in one place uh, versus scattering all over the site. So there's a lot of good resources there for you to pick up on. And this is a way to contact True Tech if you're interested. Um, I'd say the best way, if you sign up for the newsletter, which would be www bit.ly slash true news, which is uppercase T and uppercase N. It's got to be exactly that format. That'll take you to our newsletter sign up page. Uh, we send out a newsletter at least once a month, sometimes uh, twice a month if we have any specials or things going on or sales. Um, but you can pick up on just about everything new that's going on with us new products, uh, new downloads, news in the industry. It's a really good way to keep up to date with things. And of course, if you wanted to go direct to any of these events, um, training material, video, uh, this is all available Facebook or Twitter, LinkedIn, if you want to follow us that way, or Pinterest. Um, and uh, that's or go on Google+. So I'm going to stop the recording now.